1122. Scott Dockerman writes for TheAthletic.com. We have a lot of analysts who join us from TheAthletic.com, and he wrote an article today about the Big Ten looking down the road, not too far down the road, just around the corner on the possibility of divisions being eliminated and the number of conference games lowering because of the possible alliance and how that works out. Scott Dockerman joins us, covers Iowa as well, and the Big Ten, Sikkim 365 Radio. Scott, it, it looks like, it seems like to me that most people are looking to add maybe conference games. Did this surprise you, or because of the alliance, was this imminent if it happens? I think right now that the Big Ten has been in flux for a lot of years on how it does scheduling, and that's really ever since it added Nebraska in 2011. It first split into divisions, as we remember, the Legends and Leaders divisions that were trying to be equitable divisions, and then it decided to flip and go geographic when it expanded again. And it was eight games all the way up until 2016, and now it's nine. And, and what they're finding out is that some schools don't have a lot of flexibility. I mean, specific to the one I cover in the state I live, Iowa, Iowa State's a big deal. Well, if Iowa's already playing nine uh you know, games in the Big Ten, and then Iowa State's the tenth uh, Power Five opponent. It's not going to play anybody else. So then you start getting a stagnant type of look. So when you are adding the alliance to that, uh, a school like Iowa has to say, "Look, we're going to have to go down to eight games in order to play some of these alliance opponents." And I think now is a good time for the league to take a step back, anyway, because it has to flip its schedule every year. Because during the COVID year, there were six different games that that ended up being played on the same campuses as in 2019. And uh, so every year they're they're having to redo it anyway. So right now is the time for them to look at everything. The CFP plays a big role into this. And, uh, and so right now, it's, it's, a, it's a primary discussion among the administrators of the Big Ten. Do you think that eliminating divisions will uh, kind of invigorate scheduling in that uh, people maybe not get tired of seeing the, the same teams that they, they may see all, all the time? I think so. I think in some ways what it'll do is it'll establish some regularity. I mean, there are some really weird outliers in the Big Ten, kind of like the SEC for that matter. But whereas, uh, like, Illinois and Indiana used to play uh, every year. And then once uh, they, they flipped over to the uh, to the geographic divisions and they had that little line between them, uh, Illinois hasn't gone to Bloomington since 2013. And Iowa hasn't played at Ohio State since 2013. So there's some really strange scenarios that whereas if they were to say there's a 14 team league everybody plays three designated permanent rivals and then you could cycle through the other 10 teams you know two years on two years off kind of like the old big 12 north big 12 south or uh, or every other year they could even do that so i think there's some possibilities i think it'll be fun for, for some schools to see one another uh, you know because this is an old league there's a lot of rivals rivalries that that crossed all these geographic boundaries that don't get played with a lot of regularity. And, and you know, a Minnesota-Michigan come to mind. They play for the oldest traveling trophy, the, the little brown jug, but they don't play very regularly anymore. And maybe this would allow them to play, you know, at least every two years instead of uh, right now, which is three, sometimes four years down the road. Scott, what have you been your thoughts on uh, the alliance at this point? I mean, I know not a lot has happened in this, this first year since it was, you know, put together, uh, but certainly a lot of, uh, playoff uh, input has, has come from the Alliance, and, and you know that's that's played a big role in why we're kind of at the stalemate we are right now. But what have been kind of your thoughts on the Alliance uh, here in this first year? I think it's fascinating, but I, I think until it actually hits, uh, you know, when it comes to scheduling, yeah. I'm not sure that there'll be much, uh, you know, really thought in Big Ten country. I mean, it's it's kind of strange because I think this gets to the heart of the question of whether to drop from nine games to eight, and that is. Is it more valuable to the league to have a, say, a, an Iowa Michigan State game, or is it to have Iowa versus Utah or mm-hmm. Virginia Tech? And then you go all the way down the line, and then you have, you know, an Illinois Indiana series, which doesn't move the needle at all nationally, but to each other, it's a big deal. But would you rather have that, or would you rather have a Illinois Wake Forest or Washington State Indiana game and that won't move the dash the needle nationally either so I think that's what a lot of the discussion is right now uh, certainly among the fans I, I think there's some interest and excitement like there who wouldn't be excited for a Ohio State USC or a Michigan uh, Clemson game but but when you start getting past the the, the top tier ones it's kind of like interleague baseball uh, you got the Yankees and the Dodgers but 
nobody's really clamoring to see the Padres play the Rays. Yeah, that's a great point. And then one of the issues with that, though, if you're Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Wisconsin, whoever, uh, and on the elite side of the Pac-12 or whoever, you know, you you already might have, um, Scott, maybe one or two, a non-conference game or two that's pretty salty. So if you want to match up the better teams, isn't that also then – kind of moving the needle even though strength of schedule is good you're putting yourself up for an opportunity to lose a game yeah and i think that's where it kind of comes down to the college football playoff discussion Mm -hmm. i think if you get into the 12 teams then if you're ohio state and you play clemson and you lose a close game at at death valley it's not going to kill you you'll still be fine but if you're talking about a four-team debate and you go play Clemson, and you lose a close one, and then say you lose one more in the Big Ten, you could be eliminated from the playoff. And I think that's probably part of it. I mean, none of these teams are really scared to play out of conference, good opponents. But but I do think it, it does enter that conversation because, as you said, if Ohio State's playing Clemson and they've already got a game scheduled against, I don't know, Georgia or, or Texas or somebody like that, and you're also playing Penn State, with uh, you know Michigan, maybe Iowa or Wisconsin as well, Michigan State, You've got a pretty full schedule, and if you get two losses, we haven't seen a two-loss team yet make the playoffs. So that's part of the discussion now, um, and I think that's why they really want to have this debate go on. Uh, you know, it, it, try to get some clarity of the CFP before they really establish whether or not they'll eliminate divisions or cut the games from from nine to eight. So, Scott, to uh, your column on the uh, Iowa's uh, financial situation. How did they get themselves in this position worse than everybody was affected by COVID and and, and most everybody lost money, but they lost a lot of money. How did they find themselves on the end of that stick? Yeah, this one was pretty difficult for Iowa, just simply on timing in some ways, because they they agreed that they had a, a North End Zone project that cost $90 million dollars that just finalized in 2019. And, and a lot of it were, were new suites, a new club area. And a lot of that was tied to giving and, and, and contributions. Well, in 2020, the Big Ten didn't allow any fans to go into that stadium. And so any all the mo- money that they had to spend, you know, from debt service, uh, because it was a bonded project, uh, you know, went to that big coffer and, and, and then they couldn't get a way to, to reclaim it. So that's why their debt service was at twenty four and a half million, and everybody else's was significantly less than that. I think everybody that I've charted so far has been at least eleven million dollars less than that. So it really burned them worse than anybody else. Now it was a tough situation on every school in America because you couldn't have full stadiums and and what have you. But anyway, and the Big Ten didn't start play until really late, and then no fans in the stands. It was uh, it was extremely costly. In Iowa, I estimated lost football direct football revenue alone was right around 63 million dollars and then when you when you start adding the debt service and other things that's when it really became difficult even when they were cutting a lot of costs and and trimming some expenses and and laying off people it still was way i mean 42 million dollars is a lot of money yeah, it is. that's why when I saw that article, it was like $42 million, you know, just the tens of millions that are there. So what is the, the correction? Is it just simply getting people back, you know, butts in seats over time and uh, and all of that? How do they kind of feel like they're going to navigate getting out of that hole a little bit? They had to borrow $50 million from the university itself to cover that shortfall. Uh, and then they're going to pay that off over a 15-year period. I mean, it's not there's not a lot of interest. <laughs> and on that note, because it's basically taken from one pocket to the other, but uh, it, you know, and they could pay it off any time. There won't be any early penalties, so that that's how they navigated it right now. And they did cut uh, four sports initially, and now it's three: one cut, reinstated. So you know, they're going to trim some expenses, but yeah, getting a seventy thousand seat stadium full every Saturday like it did this last fall certainly will help get them back on the course. Did you ever ask Gary Barta why in the hell he would ever want to be the spokesman for the college football playoff anyway? I have. I have a couple of times. <laughs> and I'm like, why? Why would you do this to yourself? I mean, you, you could just see it every week. And, and I, I cringed when he got the job because I've known Gary for a long time. And, and I thought, oh, boy, this isn't going to be pretty, you know, because I know how things work. And, and for the last two years, he got subjugated to that. So I – I think yesterday was one of his happiest days when he finally got announced that, that somebody else was taking over for him. And, and uh, I asked him exactly that same question and yesterday, and 
And he said, well, I was very happy with my time, and now I'm very happy to pass it along to somebody else. So, I just, I want to know how they can, like, if I were, if they asked me to do it, I would say, okay, well, how can you not send me into the firing line when clearly there's no answers coming from the rest of the people in that room? So who's ever there answering questions from Reese Davis has to just make something up. Yeah, it is really difficult. I talked to him about that last year, specifically in 2020, because he was in a position where he had to advocate for Iowa State over a Big Ten school in Indiana. And I mean, Iowa and Iowa State are huge rivals in all aspects. And it actually hurts his program in so many different ways if he's, you know, pushing an Iowa State to the Fiesta Bowl over, uh, you know, a team that actually could get him more money, <laughs> you know, by, by making a bigger bowl appearance. And, uh, and, and that's, one of the things he was really discussing was just it, it, it's hard because sometimes he doesn't even believe what's being said or he voted a different way, but he has to go out and try to, to justify it. And then like this year with Cincinnati, he, he if he stumbles over his words a bit that he really becomes a, uh, you know, public enemy number one. So <laughs> yeah, I think he's glad to hang that out because that wasn't really a comfortable position for it. Scott, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks for jumping on with us on many things, big 10 and Iowa athletics football and much more scott Docterman again it's uh with the athletic.com wrote the article big 10 discussing potential elimination of divisions as part of future scheduling I, plans i kind of would be for that if i was another conference i mean i'm you know if the, if the new big 12 doesn't have divisions and you just have some sort of two years on two years off plan outside of rivals then you know maybe but there's no who are the rivals right now outside of baylor and tcu that's one of the problems you know? in the well then that might be a reason to yeah. do it but the big 12 is not a part of an alliance no, they don't but have I mean, this feeder school or feeder conference like the pac-12 and the acc and the big 10 that are committed to playing each other no i mean yeah but i mean i'm just saying just in general just so if i'm a fan of a school i don't have to uh, like I'm just just taking it for my my family that are Texas A&M fans. They get really excited when A&M plays somebody that's not South Carolina in the East. Doesn't matter who it is, uh, but they're just fired with Florida, Kentucky, whoever it is. They're excited about it because that's not a game they get to see all that often. I I, I would kind of like to to not go through that if you're a Big Twelve fan because you know what's the point of having all these teams in the conference, especially in football, when you when you play them once every seven years. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think uh, just there's a simple structure you could probably put together, you know, kind of like the NFL does. Hey, we play this division's teams, and we play them this year, and then the next year we play this division's mm -hmm. teams, and, and that's pretty simple, and they seem to, to run through teams, you know, through the whole league in, you know, two, three years' time. So I, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, you got to take into account the championship game, and, you know, you know, then there's all the talk about, like, do you have their championship games worth having and things like that, but – uh, you know, I think divisions are just, they make it simpler. They make it more streamlined. And you're like, hey, these teams play these teams and then a couple of these other teams and then the top of this league and the top of that league, they meet in the championship game. It's, you know, north-south, uh, take each other on for the title. And it's just simpler that way. But, you know, if it was just a... I mean, either way, you're doing a rotation, whether you're in a division or not. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's whatever the Big 12's got to do to where you're not waiting 10 years like A&M to go to Athens for the first time or whatever. You're not waiting for Baylor to go to, to Orlando for the first time. It takes 10 years. As long as they avoid that, then I don't really care what they do, honestly. I mean, divisions, how you want to split them. I know people got a lot of great ideas, and it's fun to, to think about, but as far as, like, does, do I have, like, man, it's, it's got to be this way or – I want it this way. Not really. Like, I'm just kind of open to anything and, you know, just make sure that these teams play each other regularly. That's all I ask. All right. Thank you, Craig and Paul. And also thanks to Scott Dockerman, who covers Iowa and the, uh, the Big Ten as well. Here's a note 